Good evening. First of all, thanks to the organizers of this program for inviting me to come and meet all of you. I also want to thank the management of the magazine Mo, MO, for popularizing the work of social movements in India into this area, in this part of the world. Thank you, Ki, for doing that. See, since independence, India was divided into two camps in terms of uh, what kind of development model should be followed. And today, uh, Sunita Narayan began well by saying what she said. See, one set of people in India believed that we don't have to follow a Western model of development, but India can follow the model of development proposed by Mahatma Gandhi. And the core idea of Mahatma Gandhi was one, that he said there is conflict between greed and need. A greed-based development model cannot be sustainable. So a need-based development model should be pursued. That is one proposal that Gandhi made, that every time when you make a proposal, see whether this is going to increase greed and demands and consumption, or this is going to meet the needs of millions of people who need. The second value proposed by Mahatma Gandhi was that production, about production he said, what is important is not mass production, but production by masses. That rather than producing and dumping everything in the market, engage people in the producing process. Give everybody meaningful job, meaningful work. So this model of production by masses was proposed by Mahatma Gandhi. And the third one he said was, more important, he said, whenever you contemplate an action, whenever you initiate an action, think of the poorest and weakest in the society. By doing what you do, whether you are strengthening the poorest and weakest in the society or not, should be the criteria to measure your development model. By doing what you are doing, whether you will increase conflict, or reduce conflict. So some of us were trying to persuade government of India to follow the Gandhian model of development. But somehow the decision makers after, after independence were quite inspired by the Western model and then we went a long way promoting the Western model of development. And as a result, there was conflict. Conflict between civil society organizations and political parties. You know, political parties wanting to persuade a Western model of development. Civil society organizations wanting to, to pressurize the government to follow a Gandhian model of development so that disparity, discrimination, and poverty can be reduced. But with the arrival of globalization, globalization of market, things became more difficult for Indians. See, large number of national and multinational companies wanting to use the resources on which poor people are living. See, land, forest, water, these are the resources on which millions of Indians are living. The indigenous people are living in the forest, so they need forest. The fisher folks are using water, and the farmers and Dalit communities are using land for farming. And with the arrival of globalization of market, more and more demand on land, forest, and water. And this land, forest, and water are now commodities that can be sold and bought in the market. So more and more people wanting to make profit by selling and buying water, land, forest, and all minerals. 
So the conflict has increased. In India today, there is high level of conflict between the marginalized communities and the companies that are coming to grab the resources, land, forest, and water. In a situation like that, where you have conflict, what should be the role of social movements? That is the task in front of organizations like Ekta Parishad, right? The Ekta Parishad to which I belong. And we take this responsibility to understand the conflict in the society, analyze the conflict in the society, and see how this conflict can be dealt non-violently. Before the conflict becomes too big, before the conflict becomes too violent, how do we direct this conflict through a non-violent process and find a solution to the problems? So as a result, we were training large number of young people. We believe that young people have a lot of potential and that energy, tremendous energy that young people have can be directed for, directed into positive energy. So through various training programs, we were trying to engage young people to understand the conflict emerging out of this development model and trying to direct that conflict to nonviolent struggles. So if you travel through India, you will find large number of struggles. Recently, I undertook a journey. I traveled from one end of India to the other end of India, covering a distance of 80,000 kilometers in one year. And I visited all those struggles to understand the level of tension that is building up from the bottom. And trying to understand how these struggles can be diverted into nonviolent action and at the same time put pressure on the government to change policies. As a result, towards the end of this journey, one year journey, one end of India to the other end of India, we were able to mobilize about 2,050 organizations to come together and walk to Delhi, which was called Jan Satyagraha 2012. Many organizations, many people came together, 100,000 people came together to walk to Delhi, telling the government, look, this is not acceptable anymore. Transfer of resources, land, forest, and water, for profit making is not acceptable, because these are the resources around which poor people are living. The fisher folks are living around water, Adivasis are living around forest, and the Dalits and the other communities are living around land. So these resources cannot be transferred to the national, multinational companies, because these are the resources around which people need to live. And only on the 11th of October last month, about a month back, one and a half months back, an agreement was signed between the social movement and government of India. Government of India has finally agreed that the land, forest, and water, the natural resources, will not be completely transferred to national, multinational companies, but this will also be used for poverty eradication. This is a 10-point agreement that we have signed, signed recently. And this is because of large number of part people participating in nonviolent movement. So we are constantly understanding that not only in India, all over the world, the conflict is building up, the tension is building up because of transfer of resources, because when you transfer resources to national and multinational companies, poor people are migrating to cities and slums. And the slums are becoming big. Cities are becoming a place where people cannot live. So the villages are destroyed, the cities are also destroyed. So we need to change this developmental paradigm if we want to live a better life. But this struggle where one lakh people, 100,000 people walk to Delhi and finally force the government to sign a document that the government will rethink how the natural resource should be used, how much should be used in the interest of the poor, and how much can be given to the national multinational companies. This agreement is very important agreement. But this was not achieved only because some people walked to Delhi. 
This was because of large number of people across the globe supporting, and that is where we need to understand that in a globalizing world, social movements are very important. And social movement through non using nonviolent methods are also very important. But international solidarity is also very important. So when I look back, how did we succeed in October 2012 to force government of India to sign an agreement in the interest of the poorest section of the society, in the interest of the farmers of the society, I see four components, four major components. One, we call it power of the poor. The poor people have an inbuilt power. That poor people are not waiting for charity. Poor people are not to be looked at as if we need to help them. There is tremendous potential among the poor people. Identifying that potential, uniting that potential was one reason why the the struggle succeeded. Imagine 100,000 people walking on the national highway, eating only once in a day, sleeping in the open, and walking 20 kilometers every day. And that force, that power of poor, really moved the government to, to think that if we don't act faster, they are going to come to Delhi and it is going to be unmanageable. So one component was called power of the poor. The second component was called power of the youth, power of the young. See, large number, when 100,000 people walk, there are 12,500 young people leading the movement. And this is the potential of young people and their energy that created that strength, and that also made the movement totally nonviolent because these 12,500 young people were trained in nonviolent action because it is important that you see when people are angry they can use nonviolence they can also use violence so unless you train young people a large movement can turn into violence so the trained young people were very useful so the power of young people should be recognized and that can be an idea that can be used all over the world that how do we direct the energy and anger of young people to change the situation in the world today. And the third component was the power of nonviolence. Of course, the nonviolence and the nonviolence struggles are succeeding in different parts of the world, and that is a good news. And the fourth thing for which I am standing in front of you, I want to thank you for the solidarity that you have expressed. Not only the magazine, but thousands of people from different parts of the world wrote to the Prime Minister of India and express their solidarity. They collected one euro across the globe to support the movement. So I think in a globalizing world where resources are getting transferred, poverty is increasing, marginalization is increasing, discrimination is increasing, and people are struggling for survival, we have the responsibility to use the democratic space available today the democratic space that are available around the globe, the nonviolent history of many of our struggles, and come together in solidarity to change the situation of the world. And Jan Satyagraha, the last action from India, is just one message. But traveling across the globe, I understand there are many, many places where people are doing similar action. There is, of course, frustration, depression, but in spite of all the frustration and depression, it's very important for people to come together and act together in order to create a better world. And I want to thank you for this evening, and I hope in future we will work together to create a better world together. Thank you.